Hi, Justin. Hello, Bob. How you doing? Well, fine. Excellent. Let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright, publisher of the Non-Zero Newsletter. This is a Non-Zero podcast. You are Justin Logan. Let me read your title for you in case you've forgotten it. You're Director of Defense and Foreign Policy Studies at the Cato Institute, which now covers the waterfront, so far as certainly so far as this conversation is concerned. I want to talk about a few things today with you. Um, one is uh, America's policy toward China, especially with respect to Taiwan, something that I think you're something of an expert on. I mean, it's it's a pretty pretty high level item in your bio. Uh, your your interest in uh, Chinese strategy. I want to talk a little about something else that is uh, mentioned in your kind of boilerplate Cato bio, which is uh, grand strategy. But I want to start out talking about something a little different, which is the so-called Restrainer Coalition. As we will soon discover, that's a name you don't like. Uh, but it's a kind of a left-right coalition that shares a skepticism uh, about American foreign policy broadly, certainly including its militaristic uh, dimension. and. Uh, there's been talk, in fact, there's been talk on a podcast I did last week with Derek Davison, uh, who, unlike you, is on the left, but is like you, is also part of this kind of restrainer coalition. Uh, he and I talked about the, this question of whether the Ukraine war is fracturing the restrainer coalition, and and if so, why that might be. So um, why don't we start out? Uh, why don't I start by asking you before we get to the, the the question of the terminology, which you consider suboptimal from a public relations point of view, this this restrainer concept. And I got, I, I agree with you. It's not, if I were running for president, I'd be like, uh, can we have a, a more vigorous word or something? But uh, before we get to that, what is your conception of this coalition? How do you? I, I think we more or less agree on kind of the people we're talking about, right? Yeah. What 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 do they have in common, and 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 what do they not have? Yeah, I mean, this is my own conception of it. So, different people, members of the coalition or otherwise, will disagree. I guess. Um, I think it's impossible to talk about a restraint coalition or restraint as a political force in America in 2022 without rooting it kind of in the Middle East policies of the Bush administration and later the Obama administration, right? There was a sense that something had gone really radically wrong. Um, and everyone in Washington at the time seemed to think that nothing had gone radically wrong. Paul Jago, the, the head of the Wall Street Journal editorial board, famously referred to the Cato defense and foreign policy, not famously, to me famously, <laughs> referred to the Local, Cato- Locally famously. Yeah, within a 10 square foot circle around where I'm sitting right now became famous. Um, so Cato opposed the Iraq war in 2002 and 2003. And someone asked you go, uh, it was actually Danny Postel in the American Prospect in 2004, why didn't you guys run articles from Cato in the Wall Street Journal saying, you know, maybe the Iraq war was a bad idea? And Jago sort of sniffed and said, I, I don't know, think libertarianism has anything to say about foreign policy. Is 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 it, you know, a uh, a real political philosophy or four or five people in a phone booth? They thought it was like a really great evocative What is the phrase. answer to that question, by the way, Justin? Well, it, is it, it four kind of felt in a phone like booth? four or five people in a phone booth at the time. That's really an accurate characterization of how it felt. But I think the fact that it is it doesn't feel that way anymore, and I think you'd be kooky to characterize it in that way, suggests that there is kind of a, a burgeoning restraint uh, uh, constituency. So I think it's rooted in a sense that something went dramatically wrong in U.S. policy in the Middle East. And I think most members of this constituency think that that's not an isolated phenomenon, right? America has had these quirky ideological outbursts periodically every 20 or 30 years or so. Um, you could start in the Korean War, certainly the Vietnam War would be a part of this. And I think, you know, people in restraints say, you know, how do we keep blundering into these things? But I think as a political phenomenon, as a contemporary phenomenon, it's entirely rooted in reaction against, if you want to use, you know, sort of uh, anti-right-wing terminology, um, you know, what went wrong in the aughts and early teens in the Middle East? 
So it did start out as mainly a reaction to policy in the Middle East, uh, you know, anti-terrorism policy, global war on on terrorism. And if that's the case, you know, if it started as this uh, insistence on ending the forever wars associated with uh, with that war, many of which, by the way, are still going on in various countries, it, it, you know, uh, whether as proxy wars or with limited involvement of U.S. special forces or with drone strikes or whatever. But leaving that aside, uh, the um, if it started out as that, it maybe is not so surprising that when something like Ukraine comes along that's very different, um, you might not have the same degree of cohesion that that you had. Uh, is is it your sense that that's really the case that it's it's kind of less clear what so-called restrainers will will naturally say about Ukraine than than about various interventions associated with the war on terror? Well. I mean, I think you rightly in the conversation that you had with Davison um, got into this a little bit. I mean, I think there's if you draw the world into sort of three regions that the United States pokes around at periodically, Europe, the Middle East and East Asia. Um, I think there's the greatest consensus among the restraint coalition, if we're going to call it that, about the Middle East. Right. And so I wrote this paper for Defense Priorities a couple of years ago saying there's just not that much militarily that we need from the Middle East at all. We would do better off to just leave it alone entirely and not come up with new allies and not come up with new bases and not come up with new. Just walk away from it. It's a you know weak, poor region of the world. We should just leave alone militarily. What, ab- what about the common uh, objection that it has oil? Sure. I, so the paper goes into great detail about how energy economists think about oil markets in a fundamentally different way than security strategists, especially in Washington, do. Um, Energy markets don't work the way that people think they work. Um, So it will bore the hell out of your readers if I get into big discourse about what's wrong with the Washington think tank conception of how oil markets work. Um, But I would point people to uh, this paper to talk about, you know, it's not the case that these... um, The taps can be turned off easily. I guess Mm. I would leave it at that. But there's a great amount of consensus about doing less slash nothing in the Middle East. And I think Europe and particularly East Asia, which it sounds like we'll get into a bit later, leave a lot more to be debated. And I think that as a sort of realist member of this constituency, it's very easy for me to hold in my mind that things that I find revolting Mm. um, are recurring features of international politics, and that those things which I find revolting don't impact U.S. national security in a meaningful way. And so you can still have a debate. Part of the virtue of being the United States is you can still have a debate about whether or what we should do pursuing to something we find revolting but is not fundamentally about us. We could do lots of things. We have that luxury. Um, But I do think that there's not as much meat on the bones of what to do in Europe or particularly what to do in East Asia as there is in the Middle East. Yeah. You you use the the term realist there. Maybe we should get into that just a little because you you identified yourself as one of the realist members of the restraint coalition. But I think there are people who view the coalition from the outside and think of it as kind of broadly realist. And I do think there is part of, of realism that may be shared by people in the coalition. But why don't you tell me what you have in mind when you think of yourself as a realist in a sense that maybe distinguishes you from some other people in the coalition, if that makes sense. Or, yeah. Or if it yeah, doesn't, it just sense. say anything with the word realism in it and we'll move on. We, we went from the, 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 the really uh, uh, lively topic of how energy markets work to <laughs> IR 101 from the University of Chicago. So um, I, I, it's clearly the case that there are people in the restraint coalition who are not realists, who are vehemently anti-realist. One of and them, what, what makes them anti-realist or not realist? So my colleague, John Mueller, late of Ohio State University, I think he's still emeritus there and of Cato, right? thinks that the realist focus on the recurrence of war in international politics is misplaced. John thinks that war has basically been burned out of the international system. Humanity has learned its lesson. 
And you say, well, but Ukraine, John. So he's written a piece at Foreign Affairs saying Ukraine only proves the point, right? Um, it's almost a Norman Angel type argument that, you know, people say, well, Angel said that uh, 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 war was was impossible, was irrational in Europe. No, he just said it would be counterproductive. Right. And John says the same thing, right? And so if people want to blunder periodically and remind themselves that war is counterproductive, that, that that's tragic and unfortunate. But anyway, so John is, you know, very much anti-realist. To, to my way of thinking, realists think that a number of fundamental so-called structural realities about international politics can explain a lot of international political outcomes. One is the so-called condition of international anarchy, right? So in the United mm -hmm. States, if you do something really bad, the government will come find you, right? And it's very difficult to take on the government frontally, right? There's a hierarchy. There's political authority mm -hmm. that can impose its will. Whereas in the international system, we have the United Nations. We have very powerful states like the United States. But in a fundamental sense, it is anarchic. Not to say that there's chaos everywhere right. all the time. And, and just there, to drill down on a John Mueller point, you you're saying realists view this anarchy and hence recurrence of war as more or less a perpetual feature of reality. And John thinks it can be wound down and is being wound down. John thinks that people have learned and you know, I don't want to maybe I'm mischaracterizing his views here. But my understanding of John's views is that people have learned, particularly after World War Two, right, um, that war doesn't pay. That war is counterproductive, or, or I think his recent book called it the stupidity of war. Right. Um, and so there's learning that has gone on at the individual level and at the level of statesmen even, uh -huh. um, that people realize it would be really stupid for the United States and Russia to have a war, or really stupid for the United States and China to have a war. Mm -hmm. And so all this realist caterwauling about, you know, the risk of war it's nonsense, so, really. And am I, am I right, though, that you think that uh, that a realist believes that war is just basically never going to go away? Never is fairly extreme, but the, the structure of international politics makes it a recurring feature of international politics. Now, to, to sort of uh, uh, dump on my own side here, I think a lot of realists ran, went awry during the so-called unipolar moment, right? A lot of realists were saying, Oh, there's soft balancing against the United States. And many of them even denied that unipolarity was a thing. They said that, you know, in 1993 or 1994, we were in a multipolar world. Um, and scholars like William Woolforth and the late Nuno Montero said, this is baloney. It's, you know, two minus mm -hmm. one is one. Right. If we were in a bipolar system during the Cold War and the Soviet Union collapsed, two minus one is one. We're in a unipolar world. Um, and so I think a lot of realists made errant predictions and errant uh, diagnoses of international politics in the 90s and early aughts based on their misapplication of their own theory, right? Mm. And so the, the sort of archetypal realist mooseheads, Kenneth Waltz, you know, would later say, unipolarity was outside the scope conditions of my theory. I didn't, I didn't say anything. I didn't conceive mm -hmm. of unipolarity. Mm -hmm. So if you haven't conceived of it, it can't be in your theory. Well, and by the way, this is a tangent, but Hans Morgenthau, a, a famous founding realist, said in his book, Politics Among Nations, uh, it, it would be consistent with realism if uh, technology so changed that it wound up, I, 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 mean, I hope I have this right, that, that you wound up uh, with a world government and it kind of making sense for there to be a world government. A realist can adapt to that. But, 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 but all of that aside... Let me um, ask you a question about kind of applied realism, because realism, first of all, is this very complicated and internally diverse thing. But it has this descriptive side where it describes the way it thinks international politics work. Um, and then it has a, a prescriptive side. And I, and I think when, when some people think of the restraint coalition broadly as being realist, they're thinking of, of one one thing having to do with the prescriptive side, which is the idea that, look, the United States can't really afford to concern itself much with the internal affairs of nations. It is, it is, it's bad when human rights are violated. It's bad when they're suffering. But fundamentally, we have a world consisting of sovereign states. That's the way it works. And I think a lot of people in the coalition would say 
we we tend to get into big trouble when we meddle much in the internal affairs of nations, even to the extent of uh, in humanitarian terms making things worse. So classic case, the Libya intervention, also sanctions, which do almost nothing but cause suffering because they almost never get you what you wanted to get, and and so on. So uh, I I think. I, I think that's a isn't that kind of an aspect of realism and kind of characteristic of the restraint coalition broadly? Yeah, I think to varying degrees, right? Um, the unintended consequences, right? There's a, there is, I think, realism is kind of a conservative ideology. Yeah, I think yeah, that, it's thought um, of that way. Yeah, and yeah, I mean, there was a funny debate at Brookings years ago. Barry Posen, a sort of MIT realist. Who I Robert think is, is he respond? Is Posen responsible for the word restraint, restrainer? Uh, I think he wrote a no, book where it figured prominently. Is that not definitely? Don't blame him for restrainer. Um, restraint. He, so he wrote a book in twenty, I guess it was fourteen, uh, entitled "Restraint," where mm -hmm. he endorsed that word as the strategic. But it actually goes back to an article in the nineteen nineties by students of his, Eugene Gold, Sterile Press, and a colleague of his, Harvey Sapolsky, uh, entitled "Come Home, America." Mm. Um, that was a sort of, you know, and, and this was a popular idea among people like Gene Kirkpatrick in the 1990s, right? Was it? People forget that they're, yes, absolutely. She called on the United For States to become- For younger viewers, she was what? She was ambassador of the UN, but she, but she was thought of as a neocon, right? She emerged very, during the first Bush administration or during the Reagan administration. Reagan administration yeah. and sort of a- yeah, almost a little more Boltony than neoconservative, a sort hmm. of aggressive, assertive, nationalistic person. She called on the United States to become, I think the way she put it was a normal country in normal times. Wait, right? when did she say this? So she changed? Let me look. Uh, I mean, we, I don't have have to, we don't have to track it down. But you're, it, Bob. There, there, there are two different Gene Kirkpatricks. I mean, no, one thing. I think that, look, when the structure of the international system changes, it, it's it, rational it, for it, what it, you want yeah. to do in the international system so to after change. After the also. Cold War, she became something more like a restraint advocate? Well, she wrote an essay that, that yeah, advocated okay. for this, right? Well, God bless that woman. I'm changing my views of her are changing even as we speak. So, any the, uh, title of the essay is A Normal Country in a Normal Time. Okay. Um, she's also responsible, I think, for famously emphasizing the distinction between authoritarians and totalitarians by way of explaining why during the Cold War we could be serving the cause of right. freedom by allying with all these creepy authoritarians who murder tons of people. She's right. just like, well, but they're not totalitarians. That's who we're really against. Right. right. I don't mean to endorse her views in toto. I'm just saying yeah, there was more no, interesting no, no. And I don't mean to get us off remember. onto an ever, never-ending uh, series of tangents. So, so why don't I shut up and why don't you wrap up anything you want to say about realism and then we'll yeah. say something else. So anarchy in international politics, no ordering world state yet. Um, security seeking states, right? So states tend to look at other states and find them as threatening, not necessarily always in a military way, but you know, as a libertarian like me thinks, right? States tend to aggrandize themselves, I would say both domestically and internationally, but generally internationally. Um, you know, so they look for allies, they arm themselves to defend themselves, and they like their little fiefdoms to be secure. Mm -hmm. And because of this, the combination of anarchy. And either security seeking, or as my old professor John Mearsheimer would say, power maximizing. Do you study um, under Mearsheimer at Chicago? I, I did. Uh -huh. um, you wind up with the recurrence of war, and so some people say that this is, you know, a function of defensive things, the security dilemma. A country arming itself looks scary to me, whether or not it has any malign intentions toward me, or as John would say. You want to become a regional hegemon and you're willing to do awful things to get it. Mm -hmm. OK, well, maybe uh, by way of getting into this question of whether. So so wait, just quickly. Sounds like you object more to restrainer than restraint a little yeah, bit, even though maybe I, look, neither would be your choice. I think that in the year of our Lord 2022, restraint is not a really American concept. Right. The reality well, is we're a big, <laughs> throbbing country of 330 million people. We have an enormous GDP. We toy with these sort of millennial messianic views of the meaning of our country for the world. So restraint, we're yeah. going to tie ourselves down. That's what yeah. I, it's just not something that's alive. Uh, uh, political thing. I, so there was a term in the 1990s called offshore balancing. 
that I think it's only two words, not one, um, but it says something about both geography and action. Now, it's a little underspecified, offshore, where, balancing whom. Um, but, but, I that's think certain, it, but that certainly doesn't unite the restraint coalition, right? I mean, that's not an alternative label to restraint. I mean, you, tell, tell us quickly what offshore, and that's a particular variant of realism on the prescriptive side, having to do with how we should marshal our forces, right? Why don't you tell us quickly what that what offshore balancing is prevent the rise of a regional hegemon and and you do it the offshore part means you kind of do it without getting all yeah. that deeply involved militarily but you got your navy in the in the regions as necessary so an offshore balancer would be in favor of an american fleet hovering around china this as necessary is doing a lot of work right so if if you i think it's easy. It's so easy to prevent the rise of a regional hegemon in the Middle East and Europe that if we just came home tomorrow, no regional hegemon would emerge in the policy relevant future. And if it started to look like one was going to, then you could do more. You could, you know, countries that are facing real security threats have a profound incentive to create beachheads for the United States to come supplement their forces. Right. So I think that, you know, this is something that we really should, should think seriously about. And I think reasonable people can disagree about China's, uh, the impact of China's rise on the East Asian balance of power. Right. So to the, the offshore balance, our goal should be to keep China from exerting a kind of dominance regionally that is uh, adverse to our interests, which entails in a way being too adverse to the interests of, of Japan and South Korea, but that's not the same as saying we are in some kind of alliance with South Korea and Japan and we'll give them tons of money and station tons of forces on their soil and so on. So I think our interests with respect to you know Japan or South Korea overlap considerably, mm -hmm. but aren't the same. Um, and I would say to a lesser extent, you know, we have some interests that overlap with Ukraine but they're not the same interests. So we, Pat Porter and Ben Freeman and I wrote this article um, saying we're not all Ukrainians now, right? Which is a fundamentally realist. And it, it's it's like banal, it's, it's stupidly banal to say that the United States and Ukraine don't have exactly the same interests. Mm -hmm. But we saw this weird mania in town to suggest that they are, right? Um, and said, no, we don't have this, you know, exactly the same interests. And it feels like straw manning to, <laughs> to take up the argument that we do. Uh, but everybody's a little hopped up on this thing. And, and, and it's time to, to, to take it down a couple notches. OK, I, I want to quickly interject. I think that touches on something that actually does unite the restraint community, as I understand it, which is uh, we are not big in conceiving of our mission, America's mission as fighting some kind of global war against autocracy. Uh, so yeah, we, a lot of us think that that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. But anyway, my point is that uh, the people arguing that Ukraine's war is inherently our war. And I want to say that I, as a, as a big advocate of international law, feel that there is an important principle at stake when any country invades another one, as Russia invade Ukraine. But, but, but uh, the way this is being framed to some extent is that this is part of this war between autocracy and, and democracy. That's why Ukraine's war is our war. And I just want to say, I think skepticism of that framing, the autocracy versus democracy framing, does truly unite restrainers. And, and I think, I don't want to mention names, but I think some people who have kind of seemed to get off the boat over Ukraine, they were just never on board with that kind of skepticism to begin with. And if that's the case, they didn't belong. That's my view. And and because uh, I, I think that's a pretty widely felt skepticism in the restraint community. Yeah, I, ho I hope. I mean, I think that would be uh, a good sort of uh, uh, open, you know, uh, uh, ticket price at the door. Um, look, I mean, you know, w what we're trying to say is that we have a firmly held principle that cross-border aggression, attacking your neighbor out of fear of its external political alignment or out of uh, security fears or out of neo-imperial revanchism is against the rules-based liberal international order. 
At the same time, it's exactly what we've been helping Saudi Arabia do to Yemen over the past mm. eight years, right? And so this liberal rules-based international order is subject to some hypocrisy, uh, to put it mildly. So I think, you know, you don't, again, look, presidential administrations have to tell an ideological story about what it is they're doing in the world. The danger is you don't want to get high on your own supply on this thing. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you talk to people in the administration, you kind of hope you guys get this, right? You, yeah. <laughs> you don't actually believe your own propaganda here, do you? And I think to varying degrees, uh, some of them do and some of them don't. Yeah, I think this may be a different uh, difference between some realists in the restraint community and some non-realists, uh, probably not all on either side. But but I had a conversation with John Mearsheim, where people can Google it on YouTube, about international law. And my view is we agree there's this huge hypocrisy going on that the U.S. repeatedly violates international law and repeatedly demands that everyone else respect it. But I think we should scrupulously abide by it. And John doesn't. He thinks we should come kind of close to scrupulously abiding by it. But when you got to invade somebody, you got to invade somebody. I mean, not that yeah. John was in favor of Iraq, the Iraq war. He's famously against it. Right. But 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 I do think, um, I mean, you tell me, are there many realists who agree with me that it is actually in our interest to nurture the global uh, norm of actually complying with international law, which would mean we consistently comply with it. There aren't that many realists who agree with me on that, right? I don't think that many realists would focus a lot of attention on cultivating the norm. Right. I think that a lot of realists say, as a practical matter, the United States is wildly secure. It's the most secure great power in history. The French ambassador to the United States during the Great War said that, you know, we've reached sort of El Dorado, right? We have weak, friendly neighbors to the north and south and fish to the east and west. So realists, for reasons that don't have a lot to do with international law, say we don't have a lot of reason to violate international law by going willy-nilly and invading Venezuela or, you know, uh, Iran or whomever. So it's not rooted in international law, but the Venn diagram of what Bob wants to do and what a lot of realists want to do has mm -hmm. a lot of overlap there for different reasons. Mm -hmm. So what would you say, uh, maybe in conclusion before we move on to other things, but ab about the whole, the, the Ukraine war, to what extent is it a challenge to the cohesion of the restraint community, if any? And what are the main sources of challenge? Yeah. Um, so I think, look, it's a challenge for everybody, right? I mean, I think it's a, it's, it's a problem that our policy didn't prevent, um, that we find bad uh, and gross. And I do think, right, like there's a little, I hope I'm not, you know, being more of a uh, cynic than usual here. <laughs> but there's a sense in Washington that we had Europe put to bed right? This sort of thing wasn't supposed to happen. Um, the liberal rules-based international order had taken root in Europe, and Putin has spoiled the party. Um, and so I do think that, and there's also a great sense of grading your own work, right? So people who, you know, did NATO expansion several rounds, waved off Russia's warnings for 15 years about how they viewed NATO expansion, are now mounting this frenetic fanatical rearguard action against the idea that security fears had anything to do with Russia's invasion. Right. And I think you can take this too far, right? In my view, the war was overdetermined, right? I think it clearly, the evidence strongly suggests that this was a longstanding view, the Peter Beinart piece about what Bill Burns wrote in his memoir, right? It was just not contested that Russia viewed Ukraine's alignment with the West is being a threat to Russia. Right. It's also true that Putin has done a lot of fanciful historical analysis, has done a lot of denial of Ukraine's right to exist as a sovereign state. And I don't think you want to wave that off either, right? But these like imperial revanchist ideologies don't just emerge from nowhere, right? And so I think this idea, you know, and you pointed out in your piece, you know, this crazy speech that he gave at the beginning of the war, people say, well, it shows that NATO had nothing to do with anything of this. And as you pointed out, he mentioned NATO 40 times, right? Mm -hmm. So you could say it's not, 
It, we couldn't have fixed it by saying we're not going to stick Ukraine in NATO or U.S. military personnel on the territory of Ukraine. Um, it's, it's fine to say that that counterfactual doesn't hold any water, but I think it's really straining credulity to say that NATO had nothing to do with this, nothing. Mm. It's a pure ideological photon that emanated from Vladimir Putin's frontal lobe. And I just think that's a kooky idea. Well, I, I would also say, and I've said it before, and I apologize to people who've heard me say it two or three times already, but um, I, I think some of the things other than security consider considerations that wound up increasing the chances of invasion, uh, also in a certain sense, um, <clears throat> were exacerbated by things like NATO expansion. What I, what I mean is, you know, I, I, I think as, as some scholars have, have said, issues like respect and stature play a role, a psychological role in international relations. Putin wants respect. He wants people to acknowledge his stature and the stature of Russia. And it pisses him off when we don't. And that factors into all this. And, and, I, and I personally think that uh, you know, when people say, well, he's talking like an imperialist, I would say, well, was he talking like that 20 years ago? Maybe something has changed. And I think one thing that has changed is he's become convinced that we will not acknowledge Russia, the, the stature that Russia and he deserve, and he probably conflates those two, that we will not give them the respect they deserve. And I think that is fed into his vision of what his legacy should be, what he needs to restore in the world, and I would say, if you ask, how have we fed that psychology? Part of it has been the same things that may have threatened him in this in the security sense. NATO expansion, especially after he said, you understand, this is a big issue for us. And we just say, oh, screw you. We're going to do it anyway. That 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 has impact at the at the level of the psychology of stature and respect. And I, I think and I do think this is another thing that may separate me from some realists. I know John Mearsheimer likes to just focus strictly on national security considerations as if every country is run by this kind of national security calculator, right? That That is a, a there's a version of realism that wants to paint things in almost that simple a bunch of terms, right? Yeah, like I say, I think the, the war was overdetermined, right? Yeah, um, and so I, I think, agree. you know, John makes a story that says, uh, you know, my theory can explain this war and here's why. And that's kind of what theorists do. Um, so I think, you know, you gotta, I, big, I admit his track record is excellent. Yeah, It's almost right. enough to make you think that that is the only variable you need to look at because right. he was right about Iraq. He was right about Ukraine, at least in the sense of saying, if we don't, change our policy, Ukraine's going to get wrecked. And we didn't, and it did, and so on. So I, I give them all that credit. Sorry, go ahead. I, no, I'm, I'm, I'm Washington, D.C.'s biggest John Mearsheimer fan, I'm pretty sure. So, uh, yeah. I, I'm a fan. I'm a, I'm a big fan. I, I am. I, I, was, I, I was being snarky there. But, yeah, uh, but you, you, you having, uh, I, if he sat on your uh, dissertation committee, maybe you're, maybe you're a bigger I, I, I have no PhD. I'm a, I'm a pretender in the political science I, world. I see. Well, that's something we share. Did, so did you study under him as an undergraduate or as a graduate student? Uh, master's student. Master's, okay. Sorry, all of this is a tangent. Go wherever you were going to go. I don't remember. You don't remember? Okay, then let's- Ukraine, um, Ukraine dividing the restraint. I don't know. We've done some of this, I guess. Let's, uh, let's talk then about China a little. Uh, you know, I, one, one thing I would say about it, it doesn't have to shape what you say at all, is that you know, one reason I think it's important to revisit the question of whether our policies wound up uh, having the opposite of the intended effect and actually encouraging Putin's invasion. For example, does arming, did arming Ukraine make him think, well, I better act now, I guess. They're only going to have more arms uh, three years from now. Um, one thing, I, reason I think that's important, uh, even though, of course, you, you kind of get shouted down if you try to do it, um, is that it's not irrelevant to the Taiwan question, right? I mean, it's like arming a country can have two two kinds of effects. Uh, it, it can it can be a deterrent, but it can also have the perverse effect I just described of 
uh, being seen as an inexorably growing threat that you might as well nip in the bud. And, and, and that could conceivably be the case in Taiwan. Anyway, that's my transition to Taiwan. What is, what is your view? You know, obviously, this is in the wake of the Pelosi visit. And uh, I, I would say pretty much everyone in the restraint community uh, thought that wasn't super wise, maybe. But and I doubt you'll disagree with that. But what what is your take, broadly speaking, on how we should handle what is a very challenging situation? Uh, of course, in any yeah, way. um, yeah. I mean, you know, primum non nocere. You know, for the old uh, Catholic school folks like me, you know, first do no harm. And I think that the Pelosi visit, right? The, the first question I ask about stuff like this is, what problem is this supposed to solve? Um, and so I read her Washington Post op-ed about why she went to Taiwan, and it didn't answer that in any way. And I think that the anti-realist discourse in D.C. is sometimes inhibiting in this way, right? You could say we feel like deterrence is eroding a little bit when it comes to Taiwan, and we don't want China to think that deterrence is eroding. So we think that sending a leading congressional official over there to show the flag might help that a little bit. But Washington works in such an anti-realist <laughs> way that you can't say that and people don't say that. And I think that's a pro like that's an argument that I could understand and grapple with. But this fog machine nonsense that Pelosi's people published in the post was just an embarrassment. And I think it's quite telling that an awful lot of China hawks with whom I am conversant didn't think this was a great idea either. Um, it, because again, what problem are you trying to solve? You can yeah. advocate for a bigger Navy. You can add for, advocate for a transformed Taiwanese defense posture. In 2019, I think it was, we sold them over a billion dollars in tanks. Taiwan should have zero tanks. A tank is not relevant to the defense of Taiwan. So for hokey defense industrial reasons, for hokey political reasons having to do with the Guomindang's enduring dominance of the Taiwan Defense Ministry, um, we sent them a bunch of main battle tanks. This is a, just a completely cockamamie idea. So if Taiwan is the keys that unlock the, you know, East Asia, we need a fundamental transformation, not just of what we're doing with respect to international politics, but Taiwan needs to wake the hell up. Taiwan spends between two and two and a half percent of its GDP on defense. The United States spends between three and a half and four percent of GDP on defense. What the hell are they doing? And you can say, well, they're just passing the buck to the United States. Fair. You can make that argument. However, there are certain things that if Taiwan does not do on its own in fortifying its beaches, in developing the ability to hide sensors that it can use to target Chinese forces. There's not a damn thing that the United States can do a week or 10 days later that is going to be able to restore the status quo ante. So we have used kit gloves with the Taiwanese and inserted our own defense pathologies into arms sales to Taiwan, et cetera, et cetera. And so if people want to get the vapors and clutch their pearls and all the rest of it about Taiwan, we need a fundamental transformation, not just in Washington, but in Taipei. And I don't see that happening. And I think th this is the real dilemma here, is that we're all getting wumped up about China. We're all getting wumped up about Taiwan. But the substance of what needs to be done it's it's a necessary condition for maintaining deterrence is not being done. And I, I, it's maddening to me that everyone is just smiling and nodding and focusing monomaniacally on the war in Ukraine. Um, and I think if you talk to people in and around the administration who think that China is the big international political issue, there's a certain amount of squirminess about um, you know, we get distracted by any shiny object. And, you know, the war in Ukraine is a huge, colossal tragedy, particularly for the people in Ukraine. Um, but again, it's not about U.S. national security. And so I think you can tell a story where Chinese domination of the sea lines of communication through the Asia Pacific region impacts the way Americans live here in the United States. And so the people who are sort of China first foreign policy minded people are uneasy about the extent to which we had this, this sort of ISIS mania in the early teens. Now we're having Russia mania in the early 20s, 
while the balance of power in Asia is drifting in the wrong direction. And I, you know, as a, as a pretty restrainty kind of guy, can't really say that they're wrong because we don't really need a lot in the Middle East. And Russia, whether it conquers Ukraine or not, cannot dominate the militarily relevant parts of Europe, mm -hmm. which is to say, you know, we fought two wars in the 20th century in Europe to prevent a regional hegemon from emerging. And we won those wars. Then we had a Cold War afterward because we didn't want the Soviet Union to dominate Europe. I think we got a little high on our own supply with the Cold War. I think we thought that the Soviets were bigger than they were. But the fact of the matter is, Russia can't dominate Europe. Germany isn't going to get nuclear weapons and chew off part of France, right? We've reached the promised land in Europe in the Middle East. We don't need that much from them. Whereas in Asia, you can tell a story that's very contingent on the future. It's very con contingent on projections of Chinese economic and demographic conditions, which I think leaves some reason for optimism from a realist mm -hmm. point of view. Um, but if we get that wrong, um, then, yeah, I can tell you a story where, you know, China displacing the United States is the preeminent well, yeah, global well, power. Let me, ask, bad let me ask you, what is the borderline? When would China, I mean, I assume you acknowledge that, look, China's a rising power. They are going to exert some influence in their neighborhood. What is, by your definition, too much influence? So much influence that we should be willing to project military power to stop it from happening. What do you mean project military power? Fight a war against China? Well, let's start there. Actually fight a war against China. What would be, I mean, uh, what would be worth fighting a war with China over that they might want, realistically want to do in their region? I think, look, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, dodge the question as effectively as I can, right? The idea of what the United States should want to do is to make China not do the things um, that would endanger us, right? To, to put obstacles in the way. Um, and I think that what we've done over the last okay, 20 years. What 30, would those things be? Hmm? What would those well, things be? I wrote a paper in, I don't know, 2012 or 2013 saying that we needed to shake our partners and allies in Asia from their slumber. I've moaned and wailed about Taiwanese defense spending. Okay, okay, but 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 my question is, what are we afraid China will do? Invade Japan? Invade in, invade South Korea? I mean, no, invading I, Taiwan is bad, but what what are the things they might do that we should definitely not let them do? Well, reasonable people can disagree about where that line. Let me, I'll sketch okay, the story Okay, but you must have a you. view, right? I have views. I'm very uncomfortable with the solidity of my views about where that line is. I would like to, to, to see Chinese economic growth slow considerably. I would like to see what I think is the demographic ticking time bomb in China go off. Um, I would like for them to have internal or regional uh, limits on what they can do militarily. But the, the, the fear that people have, and I, I don't have a perfectly well-delineated view on when this becomes something that the United States should be willing to fight a war over, is that you know, Japan is very dependent on international trade. It has no energy, domestic energy production. It has nuclear, um, but it gets oil, et cetera, through mm -hmm. sea lines of communication, through the waters around Japan. And I think you can tell a story where if the plan, the People's Liberation Army Navy continues to grow at the rate that it's been growing, and if Japan continues to dilly-dally as it's been dilly-dallying, that Chinese military power would allow it to tell Japan when and where it can get supplies of energy from. Now, we've had that ability. That would be a pretty extreme action on China's sure. part. That would be, you're talking about like a blockade, an act of war? Yes. Well, that would be pretty extreme. <laughs> I mean, it was. And, and you're sure. saying we should, we should prepare the ground such that Japan itself can kind of keep that from happening in a way. I, so that, that was what I advocated in this paper, you know, 10 years ago. I worry that things are really getting away from us, that the buck is being passed to the United States. And, you know, we have an $850 billion a year defense budget. And I think if you look at what we're trying to do in the Middle East, what we're trying to do in Europe, and particularly what we're trying to do in East Asia simultaneously, the strategy is underfunded at $850 billion a year. So, uh -huh. you know, what, what I'm focused on in the near term is saying, the game ain't worth the candle in the Middle East and Europe. Right. And I would like to get to the East Asia problem eventually. But yeah, I think that, look, here's the problem, right? 
We were told that Chinese accession into the global economy uh, in the late 1990s under the Clinton administration, the famous speech at, at Johns Hopkins sites, said that, you know, if China undergoes economic growth, it's basically modernization theory, right? Uh -huh. They're going to develop a growing middle class. Historically, growing middle classes have demanded greater political rights, maybe not full-blown democracy, but a more liberal po politics inside China then that relatively more liberal politics is going to plug into some kind of hokey version of the democratic peace theory, where just as Japan and Germany and all of these other democracies have made their peace with American security domination of their immediate environment, so too will China go. And I think if you look at Chinese behavior, Chinese defense procurement, Chinese diplomacy, does that argument better explain how China views the world? Or does John Mearsheimer's offensive realism better explain how China sees the world? I think it's the latter. And if it is the latter, then East Asia is headed for trouble. So what um, does it, offensive realism predict about how far China will go if unopposed? I don't think John thinks that, that China will invade Japan. Does he think that if we, that, that, that they would like, they just love to establish uh, some kind of blockade? Some kind, and and, and, and I, that seems weird to me. I, I mean, uh, but but you tell me, how far does an offensive realist think China will go uh, to uh, expand in expanding its regional influence? An offensive realist would say that China wants to establish its own version of the Monroe Doctrine in East Asia. That is to say, the ability to dominate countries in the immediate region and, if need be, exclude foreign militaries from operating in the region. OK. Um, and you you think that we should be, uh, well, thwarting that in the sense of, for one thing, projecting power in the region, right? You're in favor of projecting certainly naval power in the region. My... Again, I like offshore balancing. I like buck passing. So I, I feel weird. I'm like channeling John Mearsheimer here. But John will say, you know, th th there's no regional array of countries that can balance against China. And I say in response for a variety of reasons, primarily in two categories, geographic, right? So John has this story in his theory of the stopping power of water, right? Big moats are good for defense. Well, it happens to be the case that there's a big moat between China and Japan. So mm -hmm. therefore, China can't conquer Japan like you could conceive of Russia conquering Ukraine. Right. So that sort of helps for defense. It helps prevent domination. And number two, technology, right? There are a lot of technological reasons. We complain and moan and wail about Chinese, what's so-called A2AD, anti-access and area denial, right? That is to say that they are preventing foreign access from particular regions and preventing those militaries from operating within certain parts of that of those regions. So, mm -hmm. but 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 that cuts both ways, right? Um, there was a good paper by Eugene Goltz and Ben Friedman from Defense Priorities talking about Japan and Taiwan and other countries can use A2AD against China, right? That is to say that it could become sort of no man's sea. It's nobody can operate offensively there. So I'm more sanguine than John is about both the bulwarks that geography and technology pose against Chinese domination of East Asia. Um, and I think that countries in the region should be sort of taken by the lapels and shaken from their slumber to say, we live over here. Mm -hmm. You live over there. So first and foremost, this is a you problem, not an us problem. And by the time it becomes an us problem, you're underwater and you don't want that. So buck up. So, you know, Bridge Colby, who everybody's mad at because he had a bad tweet, um, you know, said the other day. Uh, what was the, what was the tweet? And no, paraphrase the, Josh Howley. I don't know. He every time he speaks anywhere, people get the vapors about. He said something about the Howley January 6th. I don't know mm -hmm. what it was. I, um, it's, anyway, go ahead. Yes. He said, you know, Japan should increase its defense spending by three times. I think that's pretty sensible. Um, I think that, you know, and so I'm a realist in the sense that I think China's a big problem, first and foremost, for the countries in the near vicinity of China. Mm -hmm. And they should focus their defense procurement on things pertaining to China. Now, another thing that I think, you know, John doesn't pay attention to, at every border, maritime or land, China faces geographic obstacles, 
or political obstacles. So it happens to be the case that China claims two Indian provinces as part of its territory. Understandably, the Indians don't like this very much. And so we see recurring skirmishes on the land border between China and India. Um, everywhere China looks out, or if you look at a map of China, it mm -hmm. faces a problem going out in every single direction. It has no allies to speak of. They can't rely on, you know, the military contributions of North Korea or, you know, Djibouti, um, where it is developing a naval base. So I think China faces a lot of problems. And we haven't even gotten into the demographic and economic problems that I think I don't want to bet the house mm -hmm. on coming to fruition. But demographics are really hard to change in the near term. And for the policy relevant future, the Chinese demographic picture is swirling the drain. Mm -hmm. um, and I think for people who are worried about Chinese uh, political and military influence, that's a good thing. So you're looking at things from the point of view of, the, of China's regime. I think that's characteristic of realists to, to try to look at things from the point of view of all the players in the globe. I think it's uh, pretty much characteristic of people in the strength community. As you know, it gets you into trouble. It gets one into trouble, speaking as someone who's gotten into trouble, uh, in that people think you're kind of justifying, like as soon as you start saying, well, you know, they, they, uh, China, they don't have any friends. They've got problems. Right away, I can hear people saying, oh, you're defending them being so assertive about the disputed territory with India. And, you know, I would say like, well, wait, the only reason they have a problem is because they're disputing the territory, you know, like, but, but, um, but anyway, this, you take my point. This is this is an issue that realists and restrainers, so-called restrainers, face. Right? You know, it's a rhetorical. It's a political issue, but it's an issue. Look, I no, I I think I don't agree with your characterization. It's just a fact, right? <laughs> that that China claims two Indian provinces as part of its territory. That I'm, I'm not. Yeah, but you did. But, but I just mean in saying, into... look, you you were saying kind of, look, China doesn't have any friends. Everywhere they look, they see trouble. You you are looking at. I mean, I assure you, there is someone out there listening who was starting to say, "Wait, you're defending their aggressive policies." No, I'm. I'm. No, stating... I guarantee it. Yeah, we, let's stipulate there well, is me, someone me... out there saying that. What do you say I, to them? So <laughs> normally, I would say. I do understand how someone would say that my descriptive analysis of international politics is somehow an endorsement of right. a particular state's behavior in international right. politics. But in this case, I, I don't think so, right? I'm stating obstacles that uh, China faces to pursuing regional hegemony. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying that they should or shouldn't be pursuing regional hegemony. I'm kind of suggesting that my view of international politics would suggest that they would. Right. But I'm not justifying it any more than I'm no, justifying. No, of course. I mean, I obviously see your point of view, right? Yeah. I, I, I know you're not justifying it, but, but just, my point is this is a this is a tactical problem for realists. Restraint. You see it big time in Ukraine because the whole yeah. idea of going back and saying, you know, I think some U.S. policies unwisely increased the chances yeah. that Ukraine would be invaded. The whole idea of that is to say, wait, you know, we should have said to ourselves, if you're Vladimir Putin. You know, you might see this this way and this yeah. that way, and you wouldn't have to be crazy to see it that way. Yeah. And I think that's what we should say. We should explain why our policy was unwise. I'm just saying there's a practical matter. You yeah. do that and you take all kinds of shit from all directions. Yeah. But people saying, wait a second, you're you're repeating Putin talking points. It's just a fact that this is part of the environment that realists and restrainers face. Yeah. I mean, in that in the Russia Ukraine case, I certainly see it and have have hurt, got my share of of that uh, opprobrium. But I think you know to get back to your point about realism and description and mm -hmm. proscription, um, right? Like physics has a lot to say about architecture, right? So physics is observing the physical forces that exert themselves on life mm -hmm. on planet Earth and, as we know, elsewhere, right? And so. If architects decide that aspect of physics is kind of bullshit, I'm going to go my own way and build the building that I want right. to build. Yeah, you no, probably I look, don't I, want to I do. I agree. That. I agree. You don't have to so, convince me. So, I, you know, and it, and it may be that right the judgment of physics is a field. You know, physics has made scientific progress over time, and things that physicists used to think were true 
they don't think are true anymore. But you want to get the basics of the physics right if you're mm -hmm. going to build buildings. And so my view is that I want to have an understanding that's rooted in reality about what is driving actors to behave in the way that they're behaving, first and foremost. And secondly, whether there's anything that I can do to alter those influences on their mm -hmm. behavior. So right. it is a little clinical and it's a little, you know, the, my favorite thing about Obama was that he was cold and professorial. People hated that about right. him. So, you know, I, 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 that's how I think. And I think a lot of times, like, my story doesn't have a good guy and a bad guy, right? Um, and people like good guys and bad that guys. That will get you into trouble yeah. too. Um, so, you know, it's not a philosophy of shit happens, but shit does recurrently happen. happen. Yeah. The, let me let me uh, ask you just one more question about China. Uh, do you think that the U.S. Navy, in, what it's doing right now in terms of kind of where it's insisting on the right to take its ships and where it's kind of asserting that right by taking the ships there? And I don't even know the details of this at all. But do you think we've got it about right? It's a good question. Um, I worry that our claims on behalf of ourselves are outstripping our capabilities. And that, as a realist or, or hopefully anyone, would cause you to worry, right? Um, so we have a very forward-leaning, we're getting ready to sail naval vessels through Taiwan Strait. Mm -hmm. um, do, do you, you know, I want there to be enough money in the account. Which to cover is international water under standard interpretation of, of oh. international law. Yeah. But again, right. what problem are we solving? Right. What 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 problem does this well, solve? People would say we're solving the problem of uh, people insisting that international law not prevail. And that's an important principle. That's what they would say. I don't even think that's what they would say. <laughs> well, that's what a more enlightened version of them would say. <laughs> maybe maybe the, 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 the Bob Wright Defense Department would say that. I don't know what I'd say. I don't know anything about the region, but that's what the more enlightened version by my lights of them would say. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, look, if it's not clear, I'm pretty conflicted on this one mm -hmm. um, because I think that, look, you know, my kids are nine and seven. I think if you draw straight lines on Chinese economic growth and Chinese military power and U.S. economic growth and U.S. military power, it's not a super happy picture. I mean, I guess, you know, the question for people who, who don't think it's a big deal is, you know, at a fundamental level, does power matter in an important way in international politics? Would it matter mm -hmm. in international politics if 30 years from now, China were a much more powerful country than the United States? I think it would be. Um, I think that military power purchases a lot of prerogatives in international politics. And people who, you know, if they believe that those lines are correct, have to tell me some kind of story about, you know, I mean, obviously, in many cases, they're going to say the lines are incorrect. But in another case, how it doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, I'm afraid that I think it, it, it does matter. Um, let me, I want to drill down a little on something you said about Taiwan, just to be clear. Uh, you, were, you were talking pretty precisely about the kinds of armaments and defensive technology China should, uh, Taiwan should be marshalling. I, I think, um, you know, I read, a, I read a, a piece in the New York Times, it was back from like April, and it said, well, uh, the Biden administration is taking the lesson of the Ukraine war to be that we should arm Taiwan, you know, more robustly and, and make them a porcupine that's hard mm -hmm. To swallow. And the first thing I thought is, well, that's kind of ironic because we did that with Ukraine and they did get invaded. But then somebody pointed out to me like, well, maybe maybe the, the idea is now that we're seeing how much trouble Russia is running into by virtue of porcupine type technologies like shoulder fired anti-tank weapons and, and, and anti-aircraft stuff um, that China would pay attention to a Taiwan that was so armed. And do I read you correctly in saying, yes, you should make Taiwan a porcupine, but tanks don't do that? I would have thought tanks might do that, right? It's like, because Taiwan, if they're really, if China's really going to take Taiwan, they got to occupy it at some point, got to send people in. Tanks can kill people that come to your island. I, I don't know. But, but are you saying basically, yes, porcupine, no, 
tanks are not porcupine quills? Yes. Okay. So, the, you know, Ukraine taught us, right, geography matters a lot. Um, it's just, it's very hard to defend Ukraine's border with Russia. It's mm -hmm. very big. It's very easy to surmount um, with armor uh, and things like this. So, you know, I mean, this is what we learned, I would have hoped, in the first half of the 20th century, you know, geography matters an awful lot. Um, and Taiwan's geography is mountain and coastline. And, you know, by the time they get into the mountain, I mean, tanks are not relevant in mountains and they're not relevant in coastlines. Um, so they're, and especially, right, if you're freezing in amber, this idea that Taiwan's going to spend, you know, 2.2 or 2.3% of its GDP on defense, maybe if they get to eight or 10%, you know, we might throw in a tank or two for good measure. But the very basics that Taiwan needs to deter uh, with a reasonable level of certainty, which is a foggy bullshit term that you'll hopefully let me get away with, um, to add deterrence to China, um, they need to do a lot of things that they're not doing, having to do with defending the beaches. Um, mm -hmm. And I think like you hear some defense people offer really hokey um, views that, you know, China has uh, 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 non-military vessels that they're going to use to ferry troops across the strait, or they're going to land troops via helicopter, right? Like those scenarios are bananas because, mm -hmm. you know, helicopters are hard to fly in good circumstances and they're real easy to shoot down. <laughs> Um, so I think that, you know, there are some hokey scenarios, but there are a lot of scenarios that, you know, the, 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 the beaches on the West coast of Taiwan need uh, to be bristling, um, with weapons and they're not currently bristling with enough weapons. And I think that the balance is tipping pretty dramatically against Taiwan. And that's what goes back to this argument that I made about whatever the U S commitment is or is not to the defense of Taiwan. If they screw that up badly enough, it's not going to matter. Mm -hmm. And to my eye, they're screwing it up badly enough. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that. That's the sort of sine qua non problem. All the stuff about how many carriers we have or the nuclear balance is, is just irrelevant if Taiwan screws up badly enough. And to my eye, they are. Uh, okay, final ta uh, Taiwan question is, I have, as somebody who admittedly is not that well versed in the, the relevant material, I have been of the view that in the long run, the, if China really wants to take Taiwan at any cost, uh, and th there's no way in the long run the U.S. military can prevent that without resorting to nuclear weapons. And, and what I mean there is, yeah, we could maybe win a skirmish now, uh, but the effect of that, I think, would be to make China redouble its efforts to build up its military and its determination to take Taiwan. And in the long run, Taiwan's a lot closer to China than to us, and they care about it a whole lot more. And they are vastly more powerful than Taiwan itself, and so on. And so it seems to me when people talk about, well, no, we can do this. We can, we can, the US military can keep China from getting Taiwan. My view is in the long run, no. Uh, is that, is, do you agree? Uh, well, you know, a lot of this long run stuff turns on your assumptions about Chinese growth, right? And I have mine, um, you may have different ones, but I, I don't think, I can't think of a scenario in which the United States would want to use nuclear weapons here. Well, right. I'm um, ruling that out. Let's rule yeah, that out. So, I mean, because, you know, they, as you point out, they care about it a lot more than we care about it. We right. care about it kind of a lot, which says that they care about it a ton. Um, and it's geographically closer to them. So yeah, um, I think a lot of it has to do, I don't know about forever. But let's talk about 20 or 30 years. I think if you saw an, a complete overhaul in Taiwan of what Taiwan is doing, the question isn't whether once you get the war scenario started, whether Taiwan and the United States side prevails. The mm -hmm. question is, can you prevent the war from being started? Right. So the Chinese famously said they could wait 100 years that, you know, 100 years is mm -hmm. bleeding out over the, the medium term here. Um, but I think the Chinese, it's a domestic political uh, constraint for them, right? It's, it's they really have, um, you know, they're a Chinese Communist Party, but they have a real nationalist mm -hmm. um, political uh, legitimacy. And if Taiwan just sort of, uh, certainly if they lost the war over Taiwan, the CCP views it as catastrophic, right? right. They, 
They can't that, allow that to happen. part of my point, yeah. And, and look, if you're worried about nuclear escalation in this context, there's a lot of reasons to worry that the things that the United States would do at the conventional level would look to China like an effort to preempt their nuclear arsenal. Mm -hmm. So if you run these war games and you look at the things that the United States would want to do in a military conflict over Taiwan, we would want to hit sensors and a number of other technological nodes in and along the Chinese coastline. Well, it happens to be the case that those sensors are not just relevant um, in a conventional scenario in the Taiwan Strait. They're also essential to mm -hmm. command and control of the Chinese nuclear arsenal. So if you're in Beijing watching this happen, it looks to you like the Americans are trying to blind you with respect to a nuclear mm -hmm. strike. Mm -hmm. And this is like, I think that, you know, I'm maybe at the the, the cutoff point of people who like remember duck and cover drills. Like this is this is not the Iraq war, you know, and I think this pertains to Russia as well. We would all feel this. This is a real thing. It's not like, you know, your cousin got his leg blown off and we're all going to the mall shopping at the admonition of the president. This is a scenario that has to do with changing the way Americans live at home. So you really, it's, it's not, and you know, I, I was just tweeting about this new letter to um, send Ukraine more arms and they get into this business about, we should wave off, you know, any Russian nuclear threats because we have nukes and deterrence still works. And this is just like asinine, blithe uh, indifference to deterrence theory, right? Deterrence theory is a real thing. It was hard figuring this stuff out and just saying we have nukes, so therefore they can't respond. Right. Or there's no vehicle for escalation other than U.S. first use. It's just crazy. Right. Like, it, it, this is such an enormous problem. You want to go to great lengths, extraordinary lengths to prevent it from happening. And you have a letter from these, you know, former SACIRs, former U.S. ambassadors to NATO, just saying, ah, Putin could go to hell. He knows we have nukes. And like, you're, you're, you're like literally putting a to be sure line in your letter about nuclear war. This is like, it's not, I just, I don't know. And it can't be generational because all these people are older than me, but I, it, it, we are playing with fire here in Washington in both of these scenarios. And yeah, we, and, I, and I think I mean, one, one problem is of course, there probably won't be a nuclear war. And then people will say, I told you so. But I think what I would say, and you would probably say is like, when you're talking about nuclear war, increasing the chances from 3% to 5% is unacceptable unless you're getting a whole lot for it. And of course, if you increase them from three to five, there probably won't be a war. And you can look back and say, see, I told you so. But if you keep doing, you know, as a matter of consistent policy, that's not smart. Uh, let me, let me, the fi final thing on China, I think I said that already. Anyway, I, all of this to me is a reason to want to keep China from invading Taiwan to have a means other than, I mean, turning Taiwan into a porcupine, if it works, God bless you, fine. But I would like to have uh, a way of just making China less inclined to want to invade Taiwan <laughs> in the first place, right? Sure. And, and, and I would say there's all kinds of U.S. policies over the last 20 or 30 years that maybe uh, maybe a spe well, that maybe could have been better engineered to get us to that place where China is like, you know, I, I just we don't really need we can we can continue to kick the can down the road. I, 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 I kind of think, I mean, especially when I listen to John Mearsheimer, that maybe maybe he's less inclined to think. And I'm taking him as as a realist. Maybe he's less inclined to think that it is possible to keep China from kicking the can down the road. He, he has a little bit more of an idea that inherently these rising powers just do certain kinds of things and throw their weight around certain kinds of ways. Maybe he'd be less uh, hopeful than I am about engineering a, a, a policy, including diplomatic policy toward China that just made them less inclined to invade in the first place, leaving aside how formidable the task seemed to them. Uh, am I right in thinking that yeah, there's a certain kind of realist that just doesn't uh, doesn't think I'm going to have much luck down that path. Or am I wrong? Am I wrong totally about Mearsheimer and realists and everything? Why don't you give the short version of your argument, and I'll see if it uh, clears the hurdle. 
Well, my argument is just uh, it is not a fact of nature that China ev- sooner or later will have to actually possess Taiwan it, it from its point of view, that you could conceivably engineer relations between other nations and China in a way that made it not feel compelled to take Taiwan and made it kind of eternally content with this weird, ambiguous situation where it says, someday we hope for unification. And maybe there would be more in the way of, of detente between Taiwan and China and fine. And it would say, see, it's working. But but uh, my view is you could hope for that kind of scenario. Kick but the can how? down you the said road there forever. were sort of policy levers that we could I, I, it, Look, if... if if you have a way, there's a tremendous demand in Washington. Well, for- okay, okay. Generically, generically, I would say, don't do the a certain amount of it is just public criticism of China. I think that that uh, that strikes the nationalist chord mm-hmm. in China. It it, uh, it 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 both it both makes a, a lot of Chinese people think. God damn it, America, we'll show you that you don't run this region. And it makes the Chinese leadership see an opportunity to marshal public support by saying, we'll show these goddamn Americans they can't run the region. Yeah. So, and, and I think there's a variety of policies, uh, you know, ranging for the various things we, we criticize them uh, for or, or sanction them for, sanction them for in ways that are almost inevitably unproductive. Uh, and it includes maybe certain provocative action, military actions and various other things. I, I don't know. I'm just saying generically, I do think that, uh, you know, it's kind of like with Ukraine. When we say, hey, we're, we're, we, we want this war to weaken Russia. Hey, we let it be known that we're kind of virtually picking the targets for the Ukrainian missiles. That helps Putin politically. Sure. And it makes his base, if anything, more fiercely nationalist and anti-American and more determined to support him in what he does around the region to show us, to put us in our place. I'm, I, I, that, that's my generic view of these things. Without So, I, look, I think I have a, you know, I'm a bad think tanker in this sense. Like, I think there's like, it, everything we do or don't do has upsides and downsides, right? I can't tie things up in a bow. And so you're saying that, um, condemning China or dallying with Taiwan or both touches this nationalist nerve in China and makes them more jittery and uh, spun up about reunification and making progress about it. I, I, uh, I, that totally. I, I'm not. I didn't mention Taiwan. I'd say like when Blinken has his first meeting as Secretary of State mm-hmm. with Chinese officials and begins it by lecturing them mm-hmm. about how they're not as good as America. Because they do these various horrible things. Some of which yeah. they do and are horrible. They yeah. think some things we do are horrible. Yeah. Probably the things they do are more horrible. I, I stipulate that. But but uh, he, he um, it's totally unproductive. He hasn't, he hasn't helped the people in Hong Kong. And, and, and I'm just suggesting that as a causal matter, again, I'm not justifying Chinese behavior, just looking mm-hmm. at the causal mechanics yeah, I, I think that kind of thing makes them more likely to attack Taiwan. That's what sure. I'm. That's what I'm submitting. Yeah, well, yes, <laughs> yes. You, I, I just said that, and you said no, no, and then you explained exactly what I hit. So it, it touches that nationalist nerve. It makes them feel threatened. Right. And it makes them more inclined to lash out against Taiwan. That that makes perfect sense to me, and I mm-hmm. imagine it makes perfect sense to the administration. The question is. Is there anything else that it does? Um, and I think, you know, there are there, there are upsides and downsides right. to everything, right? You point out if we provide arms to Taiwan, that both hopefully increases deterrence of China and amplifies <laughs> Chinese fears that there may be a window of opportunity closing. Right. Right. And I think that, um, you know, active, ant, let's call it anti-China rhetoric, um, et cetera, has a lot. It has domestic political consequences. If you look at the public opinion polls in the United States with respect to China, um, they're in the toilet. 
Part of that has to do with Donald Trump, but it's bipartisan. Um, it's tied to human rights abuses, weirdly. This is a mm -hmm. sort of, if you want an anti-realist take on it, Pew did a big survey that said, um, you know, it tracks perceptions of China's domestic human rights abuses, be it Xinjiang or what have you. Um, so I think that, you know, in part, Chinese paranoia is inflamed by, you know, U.S. needling. But it's also the case that during periods where we haven't done a lot of needling, if you look at the Chinese defense budget, if you look at the Chinese behavior in the South China Sea, they don't seem super quiescent or benign during those periods either. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that ascribing it primarily even to U.S. policy is probably overdrawing it. And part of the reason I say yeah. that is because I think there are good security reasons that China would want to own Taiwan. Um, I, I, I think as a, you know, uh, uh, military See, that, that, that's, strategy. That's, that's maybe what I'm saying. And I'm not saying that the Chinese aggression is entirely a product of U.S. criticism by any means. Yeah. I was asking a generic question, like, do, do some realists think it's just a fact of nature that China is going to want Taiwan? And I think you've, you, uh, and, and, or could we do various things, including this one thing about toning down some of our rhetoric to make that less likely? And I think you've just answered my question kind of like you're saying, no, you think as a matter of national security calculation, yeah. uh, they're going to want Taiwan. And, and, and I, I, I can imagine arranging uh, relations with China in a way that that just didn't seem like a big security issue with them. I guess that's maybe one difference. I mean, why should they if they don't consider Japan? I mean, Taiwan's close or fine, but I, I don't I don't know. I, I don't. Uh, as a national security matter, I, I Look, just think. So so, me, so you're me, saying me, if Taiwan, if there were no history of Taiwan yeah. ever being part of China, you're saying they'd yeah. still have to take Taiwan? I'm not saying they have to. I'm but as a security, have, that's the question. If you're saying it's a security calculation. Let me, so I just outlined to you 10 minutes ago how, you know, in the worst case scenario, the People's Liberation Army and Navy would grow to a point that it could blockade Japan. Right. right? And that would be bad. And Japanese people should be pretty freaked out about that. Well, you know, you're big on non-zero sum, not thinking about everything as zero sum, right? Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think that's good. And people should be, you know, trained and acculturated to do that. But not everything is positive sum. And I think... No, not, lines, there's a lot of zero sum interaction in the world, yeah, including and in international relations. Yes, Sea lines of communication are one, right? So either we control China's sea lanes, they control them, or they're contested. Right. There's no cooperative way to distribute military command of the so-called commons. And for the same reason that the Japanese would be anxious about the Chinese being able to blockade them, the Chinese are anxious about the United States ability to blockade them, be it through the Malacca Strait or in their green or brown water. So what are they doing? They're trying to push us out of their green and brown water, and they're trying to overcome this so-called Malacca dilemma, right? So this is, it's just, there's no way to positive sum your way out of a fundamentally zero-sum question. Well, if they didn't case. consider us as threatening, that might change their calculation. I mean, that's why I keep asking, is, is it the sheer proximity of Taiwan? Like by your calculation, we should invade Cuba, right? Because it's close, it's close to us, who knows? You no. Do you think that if... No, we don't invade Cuba because we're not, we don't feel threatened by any of the various powers that in principle could try to use Cuba to attack. We don't feel threatened. If and that's Chinese, why we don't feel a need to attack Cuba. If, if the Chinese or Russians, and I say this with a historical mind, mm -hmm. were cooperating in military ways with the communist government on Cuba... Right. It would send the United States... But that's the question in, I mean, I'm asking you. If we changed... Yeah. The sense that we are hell bent on Taiwan being a de facto ally, sure. would that lessen the Chinese incentive to invade Taiwan? That's so, my question. So if the United States pulled out of Asia, right, you're saying there's no Chinese uh, or there, no there Russian. Sure, that's a little too binary. I'm saying if you lessened the sense of threat and saw how they responded to that no, but, and gradually moved relations toward a less threatening See, this is what I really think realists just think, no, the world's always going to be a jungle. It just, you can't do anything. I really think that's a realist impulse that I personally strongly resist. Yeah. So, but the Cuba, you raised, you know, the sort of this question of Cuba, right? Yeah. If there is no 
Chinese or military, uh, Chinese or Russian yeah. military cooperation right. with the government on Cuba for a reason historical. Right. It's it's sort of overdetermined, right? We have them in row doctrine. But it back says, when there was, we felt threatened and we behaved differently toward Cuba. That's my point. Absolutely. And once they were out, we left Cuba alone. Right. So but, to but transpose I'm just saying, the analogy I'm, I'm, that- uh, Yeah, but I'm not saying- Maybe we should just pull everything out right, uh, right away immediately. Well, that's I'm saying, the logic of, I, I'm saying maybe we should experiment with lessening the sense of threat incrementally and seeing if China reciprocates and we can like communicate about that and get to a better place. But in this scenario, Taiwan and Japan and South Korea become Canada and Mexico and Costa Rica. And, and that is, you know, a fundamentally different world. And, you know, for understandable reasons, the Japanese and the Taiwanese and the South Koreans don't like pushing in all their chips on that bet. Not today. They, they're they not going to say, here's all my chips today. No. But but look, you don't have to be uh, a student of history to see that slowly over time, tectonically, relations change and former enemies are now allies. It happens. And I sure. think I, I think actually if our for, if our foreign policy weren't so screwed up, we might actually think about that as a goal. Crazy as it sounds. No, our allies have certainly come and gone and ebbed and flowed. They're not determined by domestic regime type or anything else. They're determined by American aims in the world, right? Um, and so I, I agree with you that that you know relations change. I just think it has a lot to do with. Uh, the balance of power internationally. And if you look at that over time, I think that explains better than, I mean, look, you're, you're making a very John Mueller point. I think you and John are very oh, synced I'm, up. I'm closer thing. to John than to yeah. John Mearsheimer on this right. for sure. I'm somewhere in that mushy middle, Bob. Oh, well, we can leave it there and hope that you slowly uh, move in my direction. Uh, I, I guess, you know, we should wrap this up. I'll give you a chance to say anything else you want to say. But but I, I should say that. Uh, well, I don't think we've found us, with all due respect for the phrase offshore balancing, I don't think we've found a satisfactory replacement for the word restraint or restrainers, uh, both because I don't think offshore balancing is something that everybody in the restraint community would embrace, and because I think, frankly, it's not a very sexy term. Uh, but uh, but uh, I I would steer people who are curious, or like, what is this restraint uh, coalition, you know, go to the Quincy Institute site. I have in the past, in the past, I've turned, I've used the term Quincy coalition because it is in fact the, uh, the institutional embodiment in Washington of this kind of transpartisan. No, no, no. You're, you're, so we should say to uh, audio listeners that, that Justin is pointing to the ground, meaning no, the Cato Institute. No, Justin, I'm saying that the Quincy Institute is the incarnation of the Left right coalition. Cato is on the right. The 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 Quincy Institute. I mean, you're not going to deny that, right? I mean, I mean, are, I are you going to come out for Bernie Sanders? That would be no, news. No, no. I mean, Cato doesn't do. Well, we have Bernie Sanders know. fans at Quincy, as well as uh, libertarians, as well as Buchananite conservatives. Who are the that's libertarians what, at Quincy? Well, they were part of the coalition. I mean, I just heard, I just, I was just listening to a Scott Horton podcast and he was praising Quincy. He feels yeah. like part of the effort. Yeah, I, I praise Quincy. Sometimes they praise us, you know. Uh, well, they get Coke money. That's, li- that's not Buchanan, right? That's, that's, that's libertarian money. All I'm saying is, I like to think of Cato as having sort of OG status in that. We, we were restraint before restraint was a you, word. You were restraint before restraint was considered cool by many people. Yeah, but you are not the restraint coalition. You are one of several uh, of several elements, I would say. Right? We're all one of several elements. Oh come on! I mean, you take my point, right? the The whole point of this, what's interesting about Quincy, is it is a left right coalition that is united by certain beliefs about foreign policy. Cato is part of the right of that our coalition. Enemies, Fine. Our enemies call us the Quincy Coalition. So you are you are in good oh, wait, company. Wait, hold, hold that up. Uh, who else yeah. used that term? You're holding this piece up. Dooney and Eikenberry. Oh, they use the term in that. Look, I like yes. John Eikenberry, but I yeah. got to say that was not a well-informed piece, I thought, in terms of what the coalition actually uh, represents. Yeah, I wasn't I wasn't a 
yeah, I, I sort of thought I could have wrote, written a better <laughs> denunciation of myself than than they did. Yeah, no, they were they were using it as a term of abuse. But you know, a lot of uh, a lot of terms of abuse wind up being adopted. The big big bang was a, a term of abuse, term of derision mm -hmm. for the big bang theory. But now all physicists believe it. So just and then you had neoconservative, which went the other way, which was a sort of passe term that neoconservatives used to refer to themselves, and then suddenly became an anti-Semitic slur. So, yeah, they're not. You know. um, uh, they're not using it so much anymore. Well, you know, Mark. I mean, they, I mean, I think what you mean is they said it was an anti-Semitic slur. Uh, that was no. I mean, the, they published books in, with titles like "The Neoconservative Reader." Um, then a bunch of right. their scholars advocated remaking the Middle East by invading Iraq. People thought that was sort of dumb in retrospect. And then if you called people who advocated invading Iraq neoconservatives, they said you were being anti-Semitic. Right. That's what I mean is once once uh, it became a term of uh, denunciation, they tried to make it an illicit term to use. Right. I know if that makes sense. Okay. Uh, well, listen, thank you. Uh, anything else you want to say about this, by the way? Um, no, I just, on the China question, you know, at a fundamental level, what you want to ask yourself is if in 20 or 30 years, China were much more powerful than the United States, do you think the world would look different in a meaningful way? And if so, how? And yeah. that's sort of a first way. And I, you know, in case it wasn't clear to anybody that was following along, I'm kind of of two minds, at least two minds about the question, right? Like I think you know, um, fighting a war with China would be really bad and conceivably China taking over domination of the international system, also bad. So we're stuck in these, you know, I have a sort of, you know, again, this sort of Catholic school view of the world um, that it's a tragedy and we're trying to manage triage this uh, international political system. Okay. I didn't realize it was a Catholic view of the world. Uh, but I can, yeah, I can see that. Um, uh, Mearsheimer grew up Catholic, didn't he? Uh, he everything. has a famous story about, I think, Sister Cecilia. Yes. There you go. Um, I'll, I'll, yeah, We've I'll gotten to there. the roots of realism, folks. Yeah, that's, well, there's a whole, yeah, yeah, I mean, you have German Jewish emigres, you have Catholics. Yeah, it's a very, uh, I was going to say a very American yeah, Mor Morgenthau story. Morgenthau was not, Morgenthau was not Catholic. No, I, I, I I'm pretty sure Morgenthau was a, a yeah. Jewish emigre. I assume. Yeah. 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 Morgenthau famously met with Carl Schmidt at one point. Hmm. And came right. down and said, either put in his notes or told an interlocutor, I have just met the most evil man alive. Uh, this is like <laughs> I don't know, tw 28 or 29. And like, wait, you know, wait, Morgenthau said that about Schmidt? Yeah, not a bad uh, judgment in retrospect. You know, I mean, it was, it was, there was, you know, he was onto something. Okay, well, uh, well, listen, this has gone on a long, long time, which means at oh. least two people found it interesting. That's right. Uh, and maybe more will. So thank you. Where, where can people, uh, they should go to Cato to find some of your stuff. What's your Twitter handle? Yeah, it's just Cato.org or Justin T. like Thomas Logan at, at, on Twitter. On Twitter. Okay, and I'm Robert Ryder on Twitter, non-zero newsletter and so on. Thanks. Thanks so much, Justin. We'll see you down the road. Thank you, Bob. Always a pleasure.